Something in the Garden There's something in the garden, the old lady with beseeching, terrified eyes told the young new vicar when he called on one of his first reluctant tours of the older, mostly housebound parishioners in the village. The woman held on to her front door with both hands, as though ready to slam it shut if her visitor showed the slightest sign of letting in something unpleasant with him. You've got to help me! The vicar sighed discreetly and reminded himself of the virtues of patience. What a morning! First there had been that mad old farmer in his tumble-down cottage with his shotgun, then a pair of ancient sisters who wouldn't stop talking, and now this. The truth was that his new charges were turning out to be unexpectedly trying, and he really couldn't disguise it from himself. He was discovering that, deep down, he harboured no love at all for the claustrophobic, middle-class, old-fashioned, rural world these people lived in. It wasn't that he hadn't tried, but he knew they had all deplored him when he first arrived, a few weeks back now, with his bike helmet and leathers, his shaved head, and his in-touch-with-the-kids swagger. When, at the end of his first week, he had invited everyone to a drumming workshop to promote community togetherness, no one had come, and things hadn't improved. The older ones turned up dutifully to church each Sunday, but they didn't seem to take in much of what he told them in his sermons. Not a single face younger than sixty, sometimes seventy, stared back at him from the congregation. Most of his new flock, he learned, had lived here all their lives, and outsiders were rare creatures indeed. There were hardly any young families in the village or in the surrounding hamlets, and there wasn't a black face to be seen anywhere. During his first sermon, his congregation had been politely attentive, but unmoved by his pleas for racial harmony and tolerance of rebellious youth. It was as if such things had nothing to do with them, which, he had to admit, they didn't in a practical, everyday sense. Why on earth had he been sent out here? He was an urban soul, unsuited for service in this closed-in backwater world, with its neat cottages and scrupulously tidy flower-beds. He didn't fit in, probably never would. Hey, hey, Mrs. Willoughby, calm down. Let's get back in touch with cool, like God intended. Cool. What's the problem exactly? What? The old lady stared at him, thrown for a moment, then recollected herself. There's something in the garden, something nasty. I daren't leave the house. No one will listen to me. They think I've lost my mind, but I haven't. It's there, I tell you. Oh, I do wish someone would listen. It all came out in a rush. She spoke with her gaze darting around them where they stood in the porch of her tidy red-brick Victorian country house, as though expecting to see something. The vicar's eyes strayed to a bird-bath placed just to the left, in easy view of the front window, and automatically read the inscription in the cement, You are nearer to God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. Yeah, right. Tell that to the homeless people in the underpasses, why don't you? The vicar silenced the voice that sneered from the back of his brain, and tried to remember what little he'd been told about Mrs. Willoughby. Wasn't she the one whose green fingers were the subject of local legend, whose garden was the envy of everyone in this benighted village? Yes, he was sure it was her. He struggled to address himself to the woman's obvious concern. Yes, but what sort of something, Mrs. Willoughby? Do you mean a person? An animal? I don't know exactly. You don't know. Well, have you seen something, perhaps, or, or heard something? Oh, yes, definitely heard. Not seen, quite, but I've certainly heard something. What have you heard? It's hard to describe. A sort of slithering. Slithering? Yes, especially when it's dark or when it's been raining, like a big snake or worm moving down the paths and rubbing against the walls of the house. Some nights I don't sleep at all for the sound. The vicar attempted a sympathetic smile. What were these country folk on? It would have to be a very big snake or worm to make an audible noise, Mrs. Willoughby. It's probably just your imagination. 
no, no, the woman insisted, looking up at him with an agonized expression and clutching at his hands in desperation. I can't tell you precisely what it is. I just know that it's there and that it's waiting for an opportunity. That's all it needs. It was plain that the woman was genuinely frightened of something, even if she couldn't specify what. At any rate, with a sinking heart, the vicar knew he couldn't just ignore her. Well, tell you what, I just came around for a bit of a chat to introduce myself and see how you are and so on, and we can do that just as easily outside, right? Why don't we walk round the garden together? If there's anything there that shouldn't be there, I'm sure we can scare it away. The old woman stared at him for a moment, eyes goggling. Round the garden? Are you sure? I mean, is it wise? The new vicar knew what awaited him if she got him inside. There would be scones and fruitcake and crumpets, things he didn't know how to eat, not in the manner these people would consider correct anyway. He recoiled at the thought of it. It'll be cool, and a bit of fresh air will do you good, too. You'll soon see there's nothing to be afraid of, and you can show me your flowers and stuff. Really, he thought, these country types were feeble. What would they make of the world he had come from so recently, with its very real horrors, the drugs, the violence, the viciousness of the city streets? They didn't know they were born, this old dear and her friends, with their comfortable homes and sleepy lives. The yap of a small dog came from somewhere inside the house, over the old woman's shoulder. Oh, do you have a dog, Mrs. Willoughby? Perhaps he'd like to walk round with us. Mrs. Willoughby looked uncertain. Well, she doesn't go out like she used to, but perhaps, as you're here, she turned back and called into the house, Tootsie, come here, dear, don't be shy. Tootsie, a small dog with big eyes and a worried expression, trotted obediently to the front door and looked up at them, her face full of anxiety. Mrs. Willoughby reached behind the front door and found a leash, which she attached to the dog's collar. I don't want her running off. We don't know what might happen to her. Tootsie didn't seem eager to come out, pulling backwards on her leash and whining as she was tugged out into the afternoon sunshine, her claws scraping on the tiled floor. Once out of the house, she went very quiet and shrank close to her mistress's ankle, looking about nervously. The vicar frowned. There was certainly something up with the creature. Any dog he had met in the city parks would have been rushing about the grass by now, sniffing at anything and everything and barking joyously. Not this one, though. Perhaps she had learned to be like her mistress, timid and perturbed. The trio set off on their tour, following a path that led from the front door down the side of the house, and then across a wide lawn at the back. The vicar saw that it was a big country garden with a wide lawn hedged in by mature bushes and well-established flower beds. The grass was nearly knee-high in places and looked like it hadn't been cut for weeks. It was, however, relatively free of weeds, suggesting that until recently it had been carefully nurtured. The path itself was edged with a variety of flowering plants. This is pretty, observed the vicar cheerily of a big red bloom overhanging the gravel. What is it? I'm afraid I'm not very good with names of flowers, except roses and daffodils. It's a rose. Oh. Mrs. Willoughby stopped in the middle of the overgrown lawn, where the path broadened out into a small circle lined with plants and shrubs. She surveyed the tatty borders on either flank with a sorrowful eye. I'm afraid it's all got very untidy, disgracefully so. The vicar tutted in what he hoped was a consoling rather than a reproving manner. There's nothing disgraceful about nature, Mrs. Willoughby. It's all perfectly innocent. It's just our way of looking at it that sometimes makes it appear disgraceful. Mrs. Willoughby nodded in a distracted manner, plainly not listening to him. Not that there was anything else to listen to. In fact, it occurred to the new vicar, it was unnaturally quiet, hardly a sound to be heard at all. Perhaps it was just that it was all so different to what he was used to back in the city, where it was never quiet. Even in the middle of the night there was traffic noise, people shouting, the sound of trains and distant sirens. The silence here was so complete it was like stepping into a painting or something, where nothing was actually living or capable of doing anything. He tried to thrust the impression from his mind. Does the garden carry on down here? He took half a step to carry on down the path, which led through some bushes towards an open archway in an old brick wall. Mrs. Willoughby gripped his arm and held him back. 
I really think we should stay on the lawn. It might not be safe to go further. It could be hiding in the bushes, waiting for us. The vicar patted the old lady's restraining hand. It was like dealing with a small, frightened child. Now, now, Mrs. Willoughby, you know you won't be able to relax until we've checked the whole place thoroughly. I'll look after you. What's through the archway? That's the kitchen garden, where I have my greenhouse and grow my vegetables, but I really don't— The vicar patted her hand again and gestured to her to lead the way. Reluctantly, the old lady did as she was bid, and led him, without speaking, under the archway and into the walled kitchen garden beyond. As well as vegetables and orchard trees growing within the shelter of the brick walls, there were rose-covered trellises, ivy-covered sheds, impressive banks of nettles and other weeds, and, in the centre of everything, a large, ruinous-looking greenhouse. The vicar was surprised at the air of abandonment that pervaded the place. Was this ramshackle, brambly patch of ground really the garden everyone else was so jealous of? Everything looked like it had been left to run to seed. There were weeds everywhere, their sturdy green stems even ascending the glass cliffs of the greenhouse itself. And what was this slimy stuff running in crooked lines over the paths and under his shoes? A small bird alighted abruptly on the wall behind them, chirruping with unfeigned lightness of heart. The vicar welcomed the relief from the deadening stillness, and turned, getting a brief glimpse of what he thought was a robin, before it dipped off the wall on the other side, presumably after spotting something edible. "'Oh, dear,' said Mrs. Willoughby, "'I haven't been in here since the start of the summer. It's all got very—well, you can see it has.' "'It's not too bad,' said the vicar, turning back. "'I must say that's quite a greenhouse you've got there, Mrs. Willoughby.' The greenhouse was a large, ornate Victorian affair with fancy iron framework crowned by a glass cupola. The vicar couldn't help reflecting to himself that there were families in the city living in apartments that would have fitted comfortably inside this structure with a deal of room to spare. As to what Mrs. Willoughby had inside, there was a lot of greenery within the glass walls, pressing up against the panes and making it impossible to see what might or mightn't be lurking inside. The vicar followed Mrs. Willoughby to the door. The old lady cautiously turned the handle, and then stepped aside to let the vicar go in first, her eyes wide in mute and trembling appeal. With just the briefest hesitation, the vicar ventured into the warm, fetid interior, brushing aside the hanging fronds of overgrown plants, and, despite himself, checking quickly under the slatted wooden benching to reassure himself there was nothing untoward there. The dog observed his movements and cast anxious glances into hidden corners, flinching from shadows or unfamiliar shapes. Everything was growing in such profusion that it was impossible to probe every part of the structure, but nothing came out at them. All seemed just as it should be. The three of them reached the potting bench, directly beneath the central cupola, unmolested. There you are, Mrs. Willoughby, you see, nothing to be alarmed about at all. The woman looked about her nervously, wringing her hands. No, I suppose you're right. The potting bench was heaped with crates containing dozens of garden sprays of one kind or another. The vicar picked one up and read the label, Kills aphids and other pests on contact. He put it back and picked up another one, which boasted of its efficacy against vine weevils. The contents of a third spray bottle were allegedly indispensable in the control of something called thrips. The vicar frowned. It seemed to him to be cruel and even ungodly to employ such fatal measures against some of the smallest and most defenceless creatures in creation. Do you really need so many sprays to keep pests down, Mrs. Willoughby? I can see you're no gardener, said the old lady tartly, taking the spray from his hand and replacing it in one of the crates. There's no room for half measures if you want a decent show, you know. Normally you'd find me out here every day in the spring and summer, spraying and putting down poison. You have to keep your eyes open, or you'll have nothing left. Unfortunately, there are chemicals for most pests these days. Aphids, earwigs, and so on. They'll eat anything. I don't know what God was thinking of when he created such horrible creatures. She looked accusingly at him. 
Anyhow, I use the lot. Everything I can lay my hands on. Oh, I know what you're going to say. My late husband used to tell me I shouldn't overdo it with the chemicals, that you just don't know what they put in them and what effects they'll have in the long run. But, as you see, it's such a large garden, and people do expect you to keep things tidy. I don't know what I'd do without them, especially now it's just me. Not that John was much use around the garden, but he enjoyed mowing, and that left me free to do the other jobs. Her voice faltered at the mention of her late husband. The vicar maintained a respectful silence for a few moments, then tried to return the conversation to gardening. Even so, Mrs. Willoughby, I thought the gardening world favoured the natural approach these days. You know, introducing natural predators like ladybirds. Yes, yes, I know all about that, the old woman interrupted testily. Some of the others in the village have gone organic, but that's not for me. I do things the traditional way, just as our forefathers did before us. You can't beat a quick spray to clear your roses, you know. None of the others can produce the quality and colour of my blooms at the fruit and produce show, or at least that was how it used to be. At the harvest festival last year, the church was full of vegetables and flowers from my garden. I'm afraid I won't be able to offer anything this year. Heaped up on the dirt floor around the potting bench was a substantial pile of large paper sacks, most of them torn open and empty, but for a few handfuls of bright blue pellets. What are all these bags? Slug pellets. The slugs have been a particular problem in the last year or two, so I got a good supply in. Their attention was abruptly distracted by a commotion in the garden, a tiny shrieking and fluttering noise from somewhere outside the greenhouse. The dog yelped with alarm. All three of them looked up, trying to locate the source of the noise. "'Something's happening out there,' said the old lady, half to herself. "'Perhaps we'd better go and see,' replied the vicar. They left the greenhouse and returned down the path by which they had entered the kitchen garden. On the edge of the big lawn, just below the spot on the wall where the vicar had seen the bird a couple of minutes before, was a splash of bright red blood and a scatter of little feathers, some of them still descending through the air. The vicar and the old lady stared at the mournful remains in bemused silence. Whatever the bird had planned to eat had clearly had other ideas. A trail of slime led from the feathers to some thick bushes close in under the brick wall. As the vicar's gaze followed the trail, he fancied he saw some leaves still trembling slightly, as though recently disturbed by something passing through them. Mrs. Willoughby, however, made no move to investigate, and the vicar felt little inclination to suggest they take a closer look. After a moment or two, by common consent, they followed the path across the lawn and back to the porch, where Mrs. Willoughby ushered Tootsie inside and apologised to her visitor for using up his valuable time. "'It's no trouble, no trouble at all,' he told her. "'I'm sure there's nothing to be worried about, but perhaps, Mrs. Willoughby, you ought to think about taking a little holiday.' There's nothing like a holiday to brighten the spirits. Why don't you go away from here for a few days? Things seem to be getting a bit on top of you, if you don't mind me saying so. You must have relatives or friends you would like to visit. Go away, the old lady echoed. Oh, no, everyone I know lives in this village. It's years since I've been anywhere else. Where would I go? I've lived here all my life. I'm rather like a plant myself, I'm afraid. If you moved me from my native soil, I would only wilt and die. It was futile to argue further. After a few more polite exchanges, the vicar made his excuses and headed back down the front path. When he reached his motorbike, he turned back to give Mrs. Willoughby a last cheery wave, only to find she had already gone indoors, closing the front door behind her. The vicar let his half-raised hand drop and gave a little shudder. Despite himself, the visit had unnerved him. It was several weeks later, well into September, and in the midst of one of the busiest Sundays of the year, that the vicar next heard from Mrs. Willoughby. When she called him on the telephone at the new estate house that served as a vicarage, now the older, grander vicarage had been sold by the church, it took him a moment or two to place the voice. Oh, hello, Mrs. Willoughby. It's taken Tootsie. Who? Tootsie, my dog. Someone's taken your dog, Mrs. Willoughby. The thing in the garden. She sounded faintly hysterical. Perhaps she really was on something, he speculated. You never knew what the doctors were giving these old folks, or whether they overdosed themselves. I daren't leave the house to look for her. I expect she's just run off. Even as he said it, he wasn't convinced of it. 
A dog less likely to run off than Tootsie was hard to imagine. How long has she been missing? No, no, it's nothing like that. I'm sure something's happened to her. She must have slipped outside when I wasn't paying attention. Oh, dear, it's all my fault. Only I'm afraid to go out there looking for her on my own. Couldn't you come over and look for her with me? It's not very convenient, Mrs. Willoughby. I have the Harvest Festival this evening, and I've got to get the church ready. Oh, uh, the Harvest Festival. Will you be coming to the service? I, I'm not sure. I haven't left the house for days. Well, do come if you can. Otherwise, if you could just hold on until tomorrow, perhaps I... He tailed off, conscious of the silence at the other end of the line. Look, I'll tell you what. Suppose I ask someone at the Harvest Festival to look in on you on their way home. They can help you have a look round for Tipsy. Tootsie. Tootsie. Will that make you feel better? I don't think any of that lot will come. They don't pay attention to anything, I say. No one in the village takes me seriously any more. Not since I told them about it. They think I've gone do lally. You're the only person I can ask. The vicar felt his patience running thin. Come now, Mrs. Willoughby. I'm sure they'll be sympathetic if I explain. You leave it with me. I'll sort something out. Now I must get on. The Harvest Festival was a surprisingly well-attended and agreeable affair. The singing was hearty, and the handful of grandchildren dragged in for the occasion constituted a delightful presence in the church. The display of flowers and foodstuffs was plentiful, even if the quality of some of the blooms and fruit and vegetables was questionable. Many of the congregation responded to the invitation to remain behind for refreshments and a chat. Whilst admiring the harvest offerings with one of the oldest men in the village, the vicar was prompted to remember his promise to Mrs. Willoughby, and seized his opportunity to see if he could persuade someone to call in on her on the way home. You know, Mr. Halfpenny, seeing all these wonderful flowers and so on, just reminded me about Mrs. Willoughby. I did hope I'd see her here, but she doesn't seem to have made it. As a matter of fact, she was behaving a little oddly when I spoke to her on the telephone earlier— I wonder if someone shouldn't call in and see if she's all right. I don't suppose on your way home you could pop in just for a moment? Mr. Halfpenny's wrinkled old face twisted in a grin. Not me. The old bird's gone completely gaga, Vigor. Didn't you know that? Forever gabbling on about something in her garden. She hasn't been right, you know, since her husband died a couple of years back. Nice old feller he was. Kept her in check. How do you mean, Mr. Halfpenny? Well, take that garden of hers. She was always potty about it. Out there all hours. Had to grow bigger vegetables than the rest of us. Wouldn't agree to anybody else's flowers in the church because they weren't as good as hers. If they drove the rest of us mad. Even old John, her husband, thought she took things too far, especially with all those there chemicals and what not. Never seen anyone like her for sprays and pellets and the rest of it. Tain't natural, we told her. Not nature's way, not God's way. You don't know what you're dealing with, we told her. But it warn't no use. Have you seen her greenhouse? Actually, yes. Full of the stuff it is. Bags and bags of it. You want to know what I think? The vicar didn't, but nodded obediently. I reckon the bugs get used to it if you keep poisoning them long enough. They become immune. Might even develop a taste for it if you keep at it long enough, if you can imagine that. But what it might do to their little bodies, I'd rather not think. The vicar recalled the dozens of ripped and ransacked bags of slug pellets in Mrs. Willoughby's greenhouse. You mean it could become food for them? I'm no scientist, but it could happen. Stands to reason. I don't think that can be right, somehow. Well, let's hope not, Vicar, for Mrs. Willoughby's sake. The amount of slug pellets and stuff she has stashed away in that greenhouse of hers, they would have a feast. The slugs could end up bigger than she is. The old man laughed so much he had a coughing fit and had to be sat down somewhere quiet with a cup of tea. The vicar oversaw the rest of the harvest festivities and, after everyone had left, tidied up before locking the church. The service had gone well enough, and the obligatory socialising afterwards. Perhaps these people were slowly learning to accept him, but he didn't feel at all at ease. Mrs. Willoughby hadn't turned up, and he felt distinctly unsettled about her, anxious even. He realised with a jolt, when he worked it out, that at least two months had passed since he had visited her. 
Now he thought about it, he hadn't seen hide nor hair of her about the village for a good fortnight. She hadn't been at any of the various church meetings he would have expected her to attend, not even those at which she was listed as a committee member. He wondered if anyone else had been round to visit her. Despite the fiction that people in the countryside knew each other's business down to the last detail, he suspected no one had. She didn't seem to have any particular friends. Thinking about that last telephone call from Mrs. Willoughby left him with a bad feeling. When he got back to his house, he stood irresolutely for a time at his front door, his key poised an inch away from the lock. The conviction was growing on him that he ought to check on Mrs. Willoughby himself. She might just be a batty old pensioner with a phobia about garden pests, but she was still one of his flock. The daylight was fading into dusk as he got his motorbike out, fired it up, and threaded his way through the village and up the single-track lane to Mrs. Willoughby's house. There was no one about among the neighbours, just lights showing here and there from behind curtained windows. Everything seemed still enough in the dim twilight as he removed his helmet and walked up the short path to Mrs. Willoughby's front door. It was open, which struck him as odd, even for this place where people rarely locked their doors when they went out. He knocked tentatively, then pushed the door a little wider and poked his head round it to see inside. The hallway was gloomy and deserted. He knocked on the door once more. "'Mrs. Willoughby, are you there?' Receiving no answer, he stepped into the house and checked the rooms opening off the hallway. Nothing. He called up the stairs, but again received no response. He paused, and then, with a determined frown, found his way to the kitchen at the back, and rummaged in cupboards and drawers until he found a torch. If he really had to check outside, and it seemed he was going to have to, he wanted to see where he was going. He pulled the front door nearly closed behind him, and followed the path round to the lawn at the back of the house. The huge garden looked ominous and threatening in the failing light. Recalling what the old lady had told him about hearing something moving about the garden at night, he switched the torch on and directed the beam across the grass towards the shrubs and bushes, right, then left, then pointed it up the long path that led over the lawn towards the arch in the wall of the kitchen garden. Mrs. Willoughby? No answer. There was nothing for it but to check the kitchen garden, too. He played the torchlight on the path and tried to ignore the glistening shine of fresh trails of slime that glinted back at him from the growing darkness. The area beyond the archway, when he directed the torchlight towards it, was dense with shadow that the inadequate beam could not penetrate. The vicar steeled himself to investigate. Really, he told himself, this was nothing compared to the very real dangers he had faced in the past, confronting gangs of young thugs high on glue and pills, or trying to calm violent wife-beating husbands and rescue their children from harm. So why on earth was he so nervous? This village was definitely getting to him. The sooner he asked the bishop for a transfer back to the city, the better. No sound came from anywhere as he trod warily down the path towards the archway, swinging the torch beam from side to side in case something should come out at him. The whole garden was entirely still. He picked his way between the leaves of the overhanging bushes growing against the kitchen garden wall, hating even the thought of them touching his face. The gravel shifted beneath his feet, but he also felt a distinct stickiness beneath the soles of his shoes as each step took him into the kitchen garden itself. Here the trees and bushes were menacing black shapes silhouetted against a violet and peach-blush sky. The torch's beam was thin and feeble in the blackness that encroached upon him. He swallowed hard and followed the path from the archway to the door of the great greenhouse, having to turn sideways a couple of times to ease past overgrown plants and shrubs. At the greenhouse door he paused and almost called out Mrs. Willoughby's name once more, but didn't. The silence so unsettled him that the thought of his little voice going into it filled him with an obscure terror. He really didn't want to go into the greenhouse. He didn't believe he would find Mrs. Willoughby in there, in the dark, tending her plants or something. But he had no choice. He had to see this through. He opened the door slowly, as quietly as he could, and stepped inside, then remained where he was and shone the torch around.
There was something in the greenhouse that hadn't been there before, something stretched out just in front of the potting bench. At first, in the deceiving light of the little torch, it looked like a big, wrinkly jelly, about six feet long and some three or four feet tall at its highest middle point. The vicar screwed his eyes up to see more precisely, but could make nothing of it. He took a step closer, hardly daring to breathe as he continued to keep the torch trained on the strange thing. If it hadn't been for its monstrous size, the vicar might have said it resembled nothing so much as, yes, a garden slug, one of those nasty, colourless, almost transparent ones, only this one was unfeasibly large and bloated, a huge, bloated, colourless, giant slug. The vicar hesitated for a moment. He didn't like the way the thing seemed to quiver a little, a subtle writhing motion running along its lower flanks, revealing it to be not jelly or plastic or rubber, but something indisputably alive, although there was no way to distinguish even which was the front end and which the back. Good God, what was this unfeasible horror he had found? He continued to play the torchlight over the surface of the hideous thing. Its skin was shiny with slime, and in places, especially around the central bulge, it was stretched so thin it wasn't quite thick enough to cloak the creature's murky innards. The vicar could make out, within the mass of jelly-like flesh, tubes and blood vessels, even something that pulsed rather as a heart might. The thing did not seem to be aware of him, but remained where it was, seething quietly. Then, all at once, one end of the thing contracted tightly, and as it did so, out of the jelly mass slid a slimy white globule about three inches in diameter. Another contraction resulted in the production of another globule, and then a third, and then a whole messy heap of globules. The vicar directed the torch at the glutinous pile of translucent white objects and knew, with a kind of dumb horror, that these were the thing's eggs. As each egg appeared, the thing writhed and emitted a small, slithering sound. Suddenly he could hear Mrs. Willoughby's words echoing in his head. A sort of slithering, especially when it's dark or when it's been raining, like a big snake or worm or something, moving down the paths and rubbing against the walls of the house. Struggling to suppress the gorge that rose in his throat, the vicar transferred his gaze to the thing's bulging torso. His lips began to move in silent prayer, but then he stopped and his eyes narrowed. There was something in there something deep down inside the revolting mass that didn't seem to belong there somehow. He screwed his eyes up and padded a few inches nearer, trying to keep the torch steady and peering hard. For several long seconds he squinted at the rounded object that had caught his attention deep within the giant slug's body. Then, with a cry of horror, he staggered back, crashing into a pile of plant pots. Long after his return to the city, the former vicar, who had given up the cloth in disgust at God's creations, continued to be troubled by a terrifying nightmare. Always he was back in Mrs. Willoughby's greenhouse, with only a torch to keep the terrible concealing darkness off, alone with an enormous slug with a bulging torso, and, deep down inside it, Mrs. Willoughby's half-consumed head, her eyes staring lifelessly back at him from inside the hideous creature's body.